Uh, yeah. All right, welcome to the September 9th, 2024, an on-credits working group meeting. Um, we'll get, uh, I probably missed, changed the order on this. Update on the revocation project manager, uh, re revocation manager project. Um, Mike's gonna talk about what he's working on. I'm gonna talk about um, other ZKP efforts and then um, where we wanna go from there. Um, Reminder, this is a Linux Foundation and Hyperledger Foundation meeting. So the Linux Foundation Code of Conduct or antitrust policy is in effect and the Hyperledger Code of Conduct is in effect. And we're also doing any spec work we do on the under the community specification license. Um, as far as preliminaries, any um, anyone have any announcements or anything else? Um, to mention as we get started. It looks like I have to log in. So I'll take a second. Anyone want to step up to the mic? Well, I mean, do you want me to start or do you want Victor to start? No, no this is just introductions. I'll jump in. Um, let's have Victor go first um for updates on the on his um project so victor do you want to jump in and yep 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 do um, you want to share yes um, okay so i'm gonna first talk about the sequence diagram of uh the revocation manager and uh yeah Ask questions. Please ask questions if you guys have any concerns. Or Mike and Stephen, if you guys want to add anything. Yeah. So this is basically the flow chart of, of the not, manager. Uh -huh. you, did, you didn't share. I did, I think. How about now? I can't see it. Can well, I, I can see his code, and then he was on some diagram. Oh. OK, sorry about that. Why can't I see it? That's weird. Can you guys see the diagram? Yes. Okay, cool. Okay, there might be something wrong with you, Stephen. Yeah. Um, wow, that's weird. Okay, so can I start or should I wait yes. for you? Yes, go ahead, please. Yep, so uh, once the revocation manager API was initiated, it will first create the server registries. So these will be the actual accumulators that holds the uh, credentials. And um, after that, the issuer can communicate with the revocation manager by they can create, add, or delete the credentials from the registry. And then the issuer would uh, issue the credential to the holder. And afterwards, if a verifier uh, asks a presentation request to the holder, the holder could create not uh, create a witness it has if it has never been created before or it can update the witness. And after that, the verifier will be able to update, uh, will be able to verify whether the witness is valid or not. So let me move the diagram to the other side and uh, launch the, uh, the actual. So can you guys able to, are you guys able to see this? Yes. So let me go to docs. So this is the Swagger UI of the current API. And uh, so first of all, we can see that the server has been launched. This is the server handle, this uh, long integer. And then I will first create uh, two users, which is two credentials in this case. So let me pull up a notebook. So this is user one. Oh, let me paste it here. And then let me create another one. So this is user two. So these are credentials in this case. So the first one is a credential and the second one is another credential. So suppose these two credentials have been issued to a holder and then the issuer, after creating the uh, credential, the issuer would have to uh, add them to the registries. So this is a post request that uh, does the um, 
add addition. And uh, basically, you can see add successful, and then this is the encoded witness. Now I'm going to add the first ratio. So yep, this is successful as well. And uh, so what I'm going to do now is uh, check the server epoch. So the server epoch is only being updated uh, once there is a deletion, So which is like when the accumulator updates. So current epoch is one. So what I can do now is to create a witness for both, for both credential. Let me try that. Uh, uh, execute, so when it's created successfully, and then this one. Yep, so both winners have been created. And then now I want to delete, delete the first credential from the registry. Sorry, hang on on that one. Mm -hmm. I thought when you created the user, you got the witness. No, the user, the the the, the witness is not added when when okay. they created. Okay. And all of that has been done by the holder or to the issue by the issuer to this point, right? Uh yes. Yeah, and now the issuer is going to delete a witness, which is essentially revoking, and it's going to do that by sending it to the revocation manager, correct? Yes. Okay. Good. So, uh, okay. So I'm going to delete this first credential. Server delete. Execute. And then delete successful, and the new commenter has been updated. So now the the issuer could issue the credential back to the holder. And we can first check that uh, whether the cumulator has been updated, which it has. The epoch number has been updated to two. And now we can see if we are able to. Well, first off, we have to update the witness, but currently I'm issuing, currently I'm issuing some issue with the, uh, I'm having some problem with the update function. But I can basically show. Uh, I've moved part of the update function to the check witness. So like I can show basically what's the outcome of this. So if I verify the second credential, which has not been revoked or which has not been deleted from the accumulator, it is going uh, to verify successfully, which is indicated by like uh, 200 OK. And then if I try to check this, Um, yeah, it prompt a 400 byte request because it has been deleted from the registry. Sure. Now you can see the error is like check when it's failed over here. Yep, that's basically what I've shown. And uh, we also have other functions that are, can be used, like make membership proofs, check membership proofs. And uh, yeah, there should be another batch delete but uh, I don't see it here. Oh, I, I still have an issue with the batch delete as well. But we also have other like util functions over here. Excellent. You're yeah. getting close. <laughs> almost, almost. Once I solve the other two issues, I think yeah. that's everything. Yeah. Yep. So basically, this is it. And uh, let me know if you guys have any questions. And um, Mike, the question for you, the MPC part of this is available? Yep, yeah, it's and it's only used for deletes or removal, yeah. that's okay. it. Right, yeah. Oh, wait, no, wouldn't, wouldn't the initialization require it? Uh well that that's just a GKG so yes that part is MPC also that basically says if you're that's if you're doing a multi-server environment or decentralized yeah. Yeah. key management of the revocation registry so okay. you're just with GKG like you normally would and there's code for that um that I'm almost there <laughs> um, okay 
that that will be available but it works for any key but you could use that do a dkg setup and then the, the only other part of this protocol that requires any mpc at all is just removals because the key is obviously sharded among multiple servers instead of just one yeah okay excellent I'm looking good stop sharing yeah and i figured out how Evidently, the Zoom update changed things. When when it goes to sharing, I now have to pick a screen that I want to look at. Pick sharing or the gallery. Weird. <laughs> All right. Um, next up, um, Mike was going to talk about sort of the work he's doing, the plans, and and sort of direction he's going in overall. So I don't okay. know, do you want to share, Mike, or just talk? I was just going to talk. Okay. Um, it's kind of all over the board. And <laughs> um, anyway. I'm taking notes. <laughs> all right, that's fine. But it's mostly just for people that are interested. So right now, I currently uh, contract with a few companies. Um, my primary employer is Lit Protocol. And we provide a decentralized um key management platform versus a distributed key management platform so decentralized basically there are nodes similar to a blockchain that are run by various companies various organizations they're vetted and all of our code runs in trusted execution environments uh, right now we restrict it to the amd one uh, for snmp sev and Basically, what that is, is the ability to run a virtual machine completely and entirely in the hardware uh, on AMD right now. It's similar to Intel's SGX, but Intel SGX only allows you to run very small snippets of code. And same with Trust Zone by ARM. Um, and then the, the one on Amazon, uh, Nitro Enclaves, is equivalent to a Docker container that has to be very small. But AMD's uh, SEV SNMP does not. It's You could do a full virtual machine. So that's what we do. Uh, we basically build a very secure OS off of De based on Debian and only provide very few functions that just runs the lit node code. And the lit node code, all it does is it manages keys in a threshold distributed way. So... Um, Right now, we support two signatures, um, and we're growing uh, to add all the Schnorr-based ones and all ECDSA-based curves. That's um, our next release that will be coming in by the end of the year. Uh, limited to two now. It's limited to two, but it's growing. Like uh, I'll get into that in a second. So right now, we have the okay. Bitcoin curve, and we have um, BLS signatures. Okay. So BLS-12381, those are the two main ones we offer at this moment. Uh, we also do threshold decryption based on a BLS signature. So in either case, you have to have a threshold. Uh, basically, you have to talk to the network and get uh, decryption shares in order to decrypt something. So the primary use is we have what are called programmable key pairs. You create that on the Lit network. Now, Lit is not a blockchain. I, I was just comparing the nodes to run similar yeah. to a blockchain, but it is not a blockchain at all. It yeah. just manages keys and the rules by which those keys can be used. So when you create a programmable key pair, which I will now refer to as a PKP, you define what access control rules you want, whether it's you have to have enough funds on this blockchain, um, you have to provide a signature from an enclave. I mean, the sky's the limit in terms of that. And then that key may be used either just to create signatures, but we also provide what are called lit actions, which run in the TEE. It's any custom JavaScript code you want, and we will run it for you in the enclave. Now, to prevent maliciousness, um, we do require that you anchor that JavaScript code to IPFS where we can, it, it's open and anybody can look at it for any malicious stuff. Uh, but otherwise anything goes. So 
Like if you want to say, oh, I want to decrypt this and manage data, but I only want to do it in a secure environment, that's what we do. So it's basically secure computation as well. Now we're adding quite a few features. I mentioned the Bitcoin curve and BLS curves right now. With the next release, we will support all NIST curves for ECDSA and Schnorr. And then we will also support uh, ED25519, ED448, JubJub, so that's like Zcash and a bunch of other curves. Uh, all of that will be available to do Schnorr-based signatures. And then where the roadmap's going from there is we're going to be doing uh, Homomorph, fully homomorphic encryption, or what we're calling FHE keys, where you can basically uh, have lit generate the decryption key in a threshold manner. And then you can encrypt something using the public key, do any fully homomorphic operations on it you want outside of lit. Lit's not required for encrypting or doing any operations at all. And then when you're done, you can ask lit for the decryption shares based on your PKP rules. And then it only returns the decryption key shares if you meet those rules, and then the client can decrypt it. So in that way, lit never ever sees the ciphertext and any of the stuff that you're operating on, it doesn't care, doesn't worry about any of that. So from a privacy perspective, it's really nice because lit will never even see the plain text or the ciphertext at all. It just creates decryption shares and gives them to the requester as long as they meet those rules. So um, as far as Anon Creds 2 works, we are also planning to add BBS Plus, Punch Shovel Sanders, uh, Keys, and Allosaur Keys in a threshold and distributed manner. So everything Victor was showing you, um, we would handle the DKG as well as the threshold updates to the, to the revocation registry. We only manage the keys. We don't control what values are added, what values are removed, um, what the current state of it is. That would be handled by the issuer. So if you look at that diagram that Victor had, I don't know, can you pull it up again, Victor, just to help them refresh? There's the, the issuer manages all the data. Oh, nice desktop. <laughs> that is cool. Oh, he's getting it. Okay. So, yeah, the issuer manages all the data associated with the registry, such as creating one, adding values, and deleting values. And all Lit would do in this case as the revocation manager is just manages the keys. That's it. And it just returns the results. So all of that's coming next year. So a non-creds 2 will be available in a threshold manner. Um, there are various companies that just want the Allosaur for revocation purposes other than the non-creds. So that's why we're doing it. Um, but the non-creds is another area we're pushing so that we can do verifiable identities or verifiable claims and that kind of stuff. So that's the primary thing I've been working on. And then how does this uh, tie into a non-creds too? What I'm working on, I'm going to be pushing verifiable decryption um, this week. And then I'm planning to add BBS plus uh, to the pawn shovel sanders such that a non-creds can have hot swappable signatures. Just pick one that supports, you know, proof of knowledge of a signature or doesn't, doesn't matter uh, how you want to do it. For, preferably for privacy reasons, it would. And then let's see what else. Uh, <laughs> any other... Um, proofs that we might need. Right now, it already has most of the ones that we would need, so I'm not sure of too many more. I am investigating, um, I kind of have talked about this in the past, uh, another way to do a revocation registry based on bulletproofs that doesn't involve pairings, um, but it allows you to do a Merkle tree up to 2 to the 38, so <laughs> That's quite a bit. And that's only if you're doing one bit at the leaves, but if we do a bite at the leaves, then the tree is not quite so deep. It cuts down quite a bit to, to like two to the 35. So it's a lot, much, well, slightly smaller. <laughs> but uh, in our latest uh, results, it was doing it in about 250 milliseconds. So that's pretty promising. And so that's another way we could do a revocation registry. The downside is 
Uh, witness updates are not anonymous like Allosaur, but it is an alternative that might greatly enhance the bitstream verif uh, revocation registry that's currently at diff. So you can think of it as at least presentations could now be um, in zero knowledge, but updates to your witness would not be. For that, you need to go to Allosaur. And then after, uh, if I might also add verifiable or fully homomorphic encryption operations and proofs to Anon creds once I get all of that working. And you might think, why would I want that? Well, imagine the verifier has some private data and he wants to you to apply some operations to some of your private data and does and just wants the result. Um, so he can encrypt it using this technique. The user can also encrypt, the holder can also encrypt their stuff. It, it does some operations and sends the result back. And then the verifier can decrypt it and see the final result. And there's no way for him to fully go all the way back and figure out what your data was. So it, to me, it's, it's quite uh, an improvement over other solutions that are out there that just do ZKPs. Uh, so there's a lot more that we can do with this information than just do ZKPs. We can now operate on private data. And that's about all I've been doing is just trying to clean up and make uh, the non creds 2 more user-friendly. Um, I might also, depending on what the needs are, help implement wrappers to other languages, uh, probably in collaboration with Steve McCowan. <laughs> and since I know he's been doing that quite a bit, but that's that's the biggest thing. And trying to make the code a little more user-friendly instead of so cryptography focused, a little more user-friendly and then abstract out the cryptography so the user doesn't even have to think about it. Yeah. And that's it. Okay. That was a lot of notes I took. <laughs> okay. Any questions with that? <laughs> okay. I'm going to ask the dumb um, cryptographic, fully homomorphic. Tell me what that means. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So the fully homomorphic encryption, you might've heard the term just homomorphic encryption. Homomorphic encryption has been around for a while. And basically what it means is given two ciphertexts, I can do some mathematical operation on encrypted data. So if I have ciphertext one and ciphertext two, I could add them together. Let's say one encrypts uh, number one and the other one encrypts number two. I can add them together. I can subtract them. And so when we say partial homomorphic encryption or or somewhat homomorphic encryption. That just means I can do adds only in the ciphertext, but I can also add plain text values. I can multiply by a plain text value. I can't multiply two ciphertexts. So that's, that's the restriction of partial homomorphic encryption. Fully homomorphic and, encryption. Uh, sorry, and, and just to clarify, I've got two numbers that are encoded. So I've got two plain text numbers. I encode them into cipher and I encrypt them. Without I encrypt them. Sorry, I encrypt them. And then without decrypting them, I can pass them to a routine and they can be added together or subtracted. The routine doing it doesn't know. Is that correct? Is that the value? Routine only sees ciphertext and it just says, oh, I need to multiply whatever the ciphertext is by a 256 bit number that I know that's public, right? You can okay. multiply the ciphertext by a plain text multiplier in somewhat homomorphic encryption or partial. Okay. In fully homomorphic encryption, you can do anything. You can multiply two ciphertexts, you can divide them, you can do bit operations. The sky's the limit. You can do just about anything you want with fully homomorphic encryption. So imagine I give you. Um, a ciphertext that's encrypted and you want to perform the entire AES decryption. <laughs> I just, I'm just representing something incredibly complicated, which is a bunch of like bit shifting and adding and XORing and all that kind of stuff. 
such that when it's done, it does the AES decryption, but I still have a fully homomorphic ciphertext. You could do that if you wanted. You could also think if uh, I never want to decrypt um, my private key, like, like let's say I encrypt my private key and give it to someone else. And I say, all right, use this to create a signature of ECDSA, but there's no way you're ever gonna be able to decrypt the signature either. I'm just offloading the computation to you. So I give it to a server. The server does the full signature, but it's all in ciphertext. So that's like generate the random ciphertext, K, invert it, multiple, or, you know, uh, at, compute the R value, hash the message, encrypt it, and then compute the final signature result and return it to the user. So I give you an encrypted private key, an encrypted message, and it can do all this processing and return a signature. An encrypted signature, and then you can decrypt it. And you can de and then I can decrypt the signature. Yep. Wow. So as a matter of fact, that's exactly what lit will do in a threshold manner. Um, because right now, lit does not support um, exporting of keys because we treat it like a secure hardware enclave. You can't take the keys yeah. out. <laughs> um, but it's a, one of our most commonly requested features. And so in order to make them exportable, we would use uh, FHE keys. So we will encrypt a, a secret key. Well, using a, a distributed DKG. So no node will ever see the plain text key in its fullest ever, because it's you know right. it's threshold, but we also encrypt it. And then when you ask us to sign or do anything with that value, we just operate on it in full in a fully homomorphic way. And we just turn return the result and the decryption shares to you. Now the only way anyone could ever get it or cheat is if all of the nodes colluded, but TE kind of prevents that anyway, because they can't extract the keys. Yeah. The decryption keys out. They just get a decryption share for that one ciphertext. So there's no collusion really <laughs> possible. We try to limit that as much as possible. So that's it. And then if you ever ask us, Hey, I want you to export my key because I want to go somewhere else and, you know, fire lit, then, we say, okay, here's the decryption shares and here's the ciphertext of your encrypted key. And it's given to the user who can then assemble it and decrypt it and have their key and go wherever they want. So we never ever see secret keys ever. They're either they're either ciphertexts or we just have threshold shares. The other thing that Lit does is every epoch, we do a proactive secret sharing where the keys shares are rotated. So right now we require two thirds of the network to be able to sign and have that validity uh, afterwards. That's our threshold is. So if we had 10 nodes, the threshold is six. If we have 12 nodes, the threshold is uh, eight. I think it's seven or eight, but anyway, it's two thirds. So as long as two thirds of the network is operational, then you can work on lit. And we chose two thirds intentionally, so it's a super majority. And we have the fastest MPC ECDSA signing algorithm out there. We also have already tested Frost and it's really fast. All of our signatures can be computed in just a few milliseconds. And so you're, the only latency you're gonna notice is from the talking to the network and receiving yeah. the results. So yeah. In fact, many of our competitors um, that were out there have actually <laughs> dropped and said, all right, we're going to pivot and just use you guys instead of trying to do it ourselves. So we're doing it quite well and better than anyone else. We Every change and every release gets audited. We just finished a three-month audit by NCC. So that, re that report will be made public soon. So you can rest assured that... <laughs> We're not inserting any back doors or whatever. And we are also SOC 2 compliant. So if you need anything in terms of like compliance and other stuff like that, we are those also. Um, Mike, just a quick question. The 
do you does lit run one network and everyone uses the one network or does lit say we'll run we'll manage a network for you and you run your network and then somebody else can run theirs how how does that work so lit just writes the code for it and we run one node of the network remember it's decentralized yeah yeah and right now 19 other parties run nodes and the whole network release is controlled by a DAO vote. So right now the DAO hires Lit to update the, the network code to support new features and fix bugs. Yeah. And then Lit undergoes an audit. And when that audit's finished, um, they say, okay, we're ready for the next release. The DAO votes. And if it's approved, then it is pushed at, out. And so there's, in answer to my question, there's one network. Yep. Yeah. Lit yeah. Just runs one network. Now there is a license that we, do, um, I'm trying to remember when it's going to happen, but we also offer a license. If you don't want to run on our network, then you can fork the code and do whatever you want with it. But if you make it for production use, then it's like you have to pay lit so much. Yeah. 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 For the licensing. So there's that option as well. And if you want to be a node on the Lit network, you stake and you earn Lit tokens for operating honestly. So that's why I said it's similar to a blockchain, but there is no state. Lit stores no state. It only stores keys. Yeah. As far as the access control rules, I believe those can be written wherever the user wants. So if they want it on Ethereum for a smart contract, that's totally fine. If they just want to say, I own an email address on Google, so all I have to do is prove my open ID value from that, and then I can use the PKP, that works too. So that's the rules that okay. with PKPs. It's actually fairly simple, but very powerful. And so our we're, our goal is to hopefully support all of the signatures for non creds too that will be used. And the only th we're just providing a thresholds uh, key management system for you. And if you want to like encrypt data and have it only operated on in a TEE instead of having to write your own SGX code or you know Amazon Nitro. You can just write a lit action in JavaScript. And as long as your key is already on lit, then away we go. And then two thirds of the nodes have to execute it. And so let's say you have it uh, decrypt the data, do some operations, and then return the result outside the lit network. That's totally fine, but all of the operations will be done in a lit secure enclave. And so we might temporarily see it in memory, but it's again, it's in the hardware memory, not the regular OS memory. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Any questions from anyone? So next steps, as far as I'm aware, you wanted to talk about adoption, Stephen? Yeah. Well, what I was going to go through was a bit about where I'm seeing. Remember, I did the informal survey a while ago. Mm -hmm. And then I've been in conversation with uh, ever, uh, you know, I, I think I reported on this, the meeting in in Switzerland um, at the um, IIW of Europe event there and the progress that's being made. And then I've been hearing more and more about how BBS. So I was going to give an update on where those are and sort of a, a, a summary of the pros and cons of the different approaches. Yeah, go ahead. So let me share my screen. Go ahead and stop sharing, Victor. Or I can just take over. Well, that's right. You own it. All right. Um, so this is an update to that slideshow I did or that 
uh, deck I did, I should just grab this. Let me just grab the key, the copy, the link. And I can put it in chat for a start, but I'll put it into the notes. Um, and I assume, Mike, everything you said there is public since you're in a publicly recorded meeting. Yep. I'm, I'm going to probably take a bunch of notes down just to 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 do that. So I I grabbed a survey of the, the places that I knew. So it, basically, I've updated the first set of slides in this um, from the various efforts. And this one I updated. This was Digital Bazaar and others. This is... Um, a combination of IETF, of DIF, of W3, of DHS, and Digital Bazaar. So it is a bunch of things working together. DHS being, and and well, all of uh, you know IETF um, being sort of heavyweights in this. Um, the, the Japanese group, our friends at Oracle Labs, um, V1, V2, the Dot Networks work, and then. I've added to this SD jots via batch issue. Um, I sort of was trying to figure out where the apples and oranges are there. So libraries, um, there's the Agora, the Doc Networks, and the Matter BBS, as far as I know, that are just at the library level. They have various features at the library level. Mike, where um, for the BBS work that you are planning, where are you getting the libraries at your own library? Yeah. yeah, just, okay. just going to donate it to Agora. Yeah. Okay. Um, various signature schemes involved, obviously. We recognize all of these. Um, and then full stack would be an OnCreds V1, V2, um, the VCDI, BBS work. Um, these are what I call privacy preserving SD jots. Um, so PP SD jots. And that is the. Um, where you're doing batch issuance. So that the, the SD jots themselves are not privacy preserving. They're all, you know, correlatable and all that. But the idea of, of managing them in a privacy preserving way by batch issuing um, a set of credentials for a single credential, representing a single credential as, as a batch of them where they're single use credentials. And then the work Oracle Labs is doing. So this is this was interesting. I spent some time coming through with this piece of it and um so what this is um is where you see yeses it means that they're supported <clears throat> or partially supported um where there's red marks are basically it's not good that there's no standard um it is good there's a specification so over here an onpreds 2 doesn't have a specification yet so it gets a mark there um whoops um the yellow marks are are negatives um the light green marks are 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 positives but not you know um not uh solid you know really good that this has this so that's kind of the range and and then everything that's white is sort of um neutral if you will so um, a non-creds V1, we can look at. So non-creds V2 still has the best with, you know, possibility. Standard is the really hard part. And that's, and that's where we get into discussions of where, for example, um, uh, I'm pretty sure there's a standard here. I should probably update this one that it's likely there's a standard. Um, VC DIBBS is almost there i should put this light because it's not quite there um uh, it's almost there um that's a big one for the community like dhs and 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 so on so the the vi um interestingly the privacy preserving except for the fact that it's not zkb based and it is batch issuance does have a lot of uh, a lot of good stuff in it and a lot of capabilities um ECDSA ZKPs is the work that's going on that was mentioned in and come out of the, the Swiss meetings. And 
um, here. The, the work is in progress and I have not heard much about it in the last few weeks. It has been summer in the, in, in Europe. So I haven't heard too much about it. So I'm looking forward to hearing if there's more. Yeah. Um, same. I haven't heard anything new either. Yeah. Um, Selective disclosure, non-correlatable holder binding, but it will not have support for what's really needed, which is holder directed identifier, issue directed identifier. Um, those are probably high. These probably should be solid greens and, and across the board with these. Um, so you might want to take a look through this. I'm going to use this in, in conversations. I'm having uh, happy to discuss you know, how I came up with the different pieces. For a non credits V2, we have a partial data model. And I say that because um, it really hasn't been, um, how should I say, um, um, standardized or, or, or specified to exactly what the data model is and aligned with any other data models. Like it would be good if it was a use the same data model as others um, to make it um more uh accepted by more parties um we don't have a specification yet and that gets us even further from a standard over here um the specification is bbs and then the standardization that's going on in in here is um with bbs signatures as the main thing just regular BBS signatures, which only gets you um, selective disclosure. That's all that BBS in the standardized version gets you. And then there are three extensions going in, and I've got this on a later slide, but three extensions going in that get you non-correlatable holder binding, holder directed and issuer directed identifiers. So while it does have a positive that it is going to a standard that can be pointed to. Um, that standard is very limited, basically only giving you selective disclosure. Um, the holder binding, the ho issue or directed and holder directed are extensions to the standard. In other words, they've got um, standard style documents, but they have not been pushed to IETF yet. Mike. Can you describe what is credential definition or key? Um, just that, um, so with, with the non-creds one, you have to have a, an object that has a whole pile of, um, of uh, keys in it, whereas the other ones have just a single key. In other words, you can use a did or, or just a single key as the, uh, as the key um, right. with, a non-credit, you have to have an object. Does that make sense? Yep. And I might want to spell definition correctly. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, this one is the interest, you know, this one is interesting because all of these are super useful. As I say, this one should be, you know, probably, I, I should probably take it off and and you just get negatives if you don't support it because th this is a big one for um, allowing a verifier to know they've seen this credential before so that they get a consistent identifier either from the holder or from the issuer that allows them um, they get a an identifier that is repeated to them so they can detect that the same um, credential is coming back. Um, but it's different across verifiers. So it's a non-correlatable identifier. Um, the other ones down towards the bottom here, I got to move this because I don't know if you can see that, but just a sec. Yeah. Um, these ones give you lots of value. Um, verifiable encryption allowing for an audit capability, equality across claims. I can comp compare two data elements across two different complaint, uh, claims uh, across two different credentials and determine if they're equal without exposing the identifier. Both of those give really high, uh, high value for, um, uh, for being able to do uh, privacy preserving, like sharing less data and yet still get lots of verification 
on the verifier side. So um, that's the list. Um, oops, hang on a second, let me move that. Um, this one is the most, as I say, quite promising, the VCDI BBS community built on a standard that that is defined at W3C, which is the verifiable credential data integrity. It means it's using JSON LD, it's doing RDF canonicalization to get a list of messages to be signed. It's using a BBS signature that is reliant on that is defined with the IETF standard. And so it's using a IET or a soon to be, so I should say it's not there yet, but it's um, in progress. Uh, this is the community around it is very standards first, meaning that everything's got to be a standard before they include it in there. Now, they're a little flexible in the term of what's a standard. So right now, um, IETF has accepted and has a working group for BBS, and it is currently so-called waiting for cryptographers to weigh in on the standard. So supposedly they've um, all the work has been done, except they haven't heard from enough cryptographers to say this is important and it should get done. And so Manu and Anil and, and others are running around getting cryptographers to say, yes, this is important. The cryptographers evidently don't need to review in depth the standard, although that's being done or, or auditing it, but they do need to tell IETF, hey, this is important. And evidently that has not happened yet, um, that not enough cryptographers have weighed in to say it's important. So that's a, that's a bit of a, a, a problem. So hopefully that is being addressed right now. Um, Mike, I don't know if you can you could help there, but um, in weighing in. Then, as I mentioned, all that gives us is the um, non-correlatable signatures and selective disclosure. So you can um, you can sign uh, the issuer can sign it, give it to the holder. The holder can selectively disclose things, and when they do that, the signatures are non-correlatable. Um, extensions to the IE, ITF standard are needed for a link secret for the holder binding, non-correlatable holder binding, and then for holder and issue directed identifiers. Um, all of those are deemed absolutely crucial by this group. Um, they are documented as IETF internet drafts, um, but they're not in the core BBS standard that is going through IETF. And this is the path to the more capabilities. So when we go back here and see all of the things that a non-creds can do, V2 that, that that's there, the path to doing those is to um, push those along this IETF internet drafts. So from a standards perspective, um, there is no schema. For the VCDI, they rely strictly on JSON LD and data sniffing, as far as I know. Um, so there's no schema and no encoding information, which makes it much harder to do the Anoncreds V2 encoding specific processing that's so important. Um, and even more important, there's no associated ZKP based revocation approach. That is a massive hole. Um, so the rest of this, um, we've mostly seen before. Here are the features that are there, signature schemes, um, and crypto libraries that are being used. These are straight answers from the, um, the community, uh, the person that responded. In this case, it was Greg Bernstein. Um, this is what... Internet Initiative Japan. So they're basically going along the same path as um, uh, as the um, VCDI with JSON LD and RDF canonicalization, but adding more ZKP features. So 
and and the rest, as I say, is just going through the various pieces. Uh, the, the, redoes the um, comments made earlier um, in this. So I'll get out of there. Um, anyway, so any questions about that or about this? What I'm trying to do with this is figure out, you know, where do we go next with the non-preds? Um, we, we haven't been able to get more developers, more companies joining in and, and helping out with this. And I think that's crucial. Um, the fact that there is a standard is helpful, like, like using the standard is helpful, but man, it doesn't have the features. We do get the features by these extensions. Do we want to add more features so we actually get predicates, so we get date predicates um, and, and the rest of these other features that that are really important for privacy preserving, um, you know, data minimization and non-correlation. And then the last one is that even if we have this, we don't have the revocation, which makes um, Alisor to me the most important thing that would build on 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 more than one project. Uh, allow start to bring together the communities. It almost seems like Stephen that we need to have standards <laughs> for yeah. every, almost every individual piece of the non creds, and then kind of build up. Like for example, this is how you do a date claim yeah this is yeah time claim this is how you do an identifier claim or yes. a domain proof you know anyway that kind of stuff yeah and then this is how you do ps signatures or bds according to the standard you know that kind of stuff and this is how we do a data schema because you mentioned that the non cred v2 doesn't have one the data model this is how you adapt the data model to the vc model. right yeah. It almost seems like that might be an approach, but I'm curious if anyone here has other ideas. Makes me realize how much, um, you know, how much work was done in the Evernim sovereign days um, where it, it was all done so people could just run with it and and <laughs> how little people want to put into putting that um foundation in um it's hard to put the foundation in you know what you talked about mike is is putting that foundation in so that everyone else can just build from it but boy getting getting collaborators to put in that foundation is hard yep. hard to find people to do it well, that's why I did most of the foundational work for at least the cryptography and donating yeah. everything that yeah. more help would come and it hasn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very little has. Some has. Yep. Yep. And okay. Like, uh, like Steve McCowan, what was your take on this? Because I know you've been here for a while. You were there for during the sovereign days. What's preventing like your company from docking a non creds V2, for example? Um we're we're looking looking at it significantly. Basically, um we use Occupy quite heavily. And so as it gets adopted in there, we'll probably pick it right up. Um that's probably the biggest issue at this point. So what are your needs exactly? Is it you just want some server side? Because Occupy to me just does the server side stuff. Well, we use Occupy for um, a lot of things. Um, and we would like to adopt a non-creds V2. So when it gets supported in there, 
we've we've done some other work to get other credential types supported in Occupy, and it's it's a fair amount of work to to put different credential types in there, different ledgers, different. Yep. So, um, just priority, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then from there, it'll be um, interoperability with other systems. It's kind of the kind of the same story. Um, you know, you know what I mean. It's just where it's adopted. It's not. There's there's nothing against it. We're actually excited about it, but. If we implement it, and then those that we connect with haven't yet implemented it, that affects the development priority. Chicken and egg. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I don't find the momentum. Yep. Okay. Sorry if that's not a super insightful answer. I'd love to be able to say, "Oh, let's add this feature," and then everything's done. But yeah, it's it's really, you know, when it's in in Occupy, that that'll make a lot of difference. And then with those other parties we would connect with, becomes that, easier. That would be the next step as far yeah. as determining the priority. But it's, it's something we're looking that. forward to. Okay, so basically what I'm hearing is just pre-built issuer holder verifier that already does everything for you. <laughs> yep. Well, yeah, that's what we want is all the world's <laughs> problems solved for us. <laughs> <laughs> but when you think about it, that's what, you know, an on-preds one had. Yeah. Everything was put together working and, and you could just go from there. Yeah. Okay. Well. All right. Um, finally, just Mike. Any other updates on audits uh, and and Agora? Yeah. So, like I said, I'm trying to get the verifiable decryption in, and then I will right. push the verifiable secret sharing in there because that audit's complete, and I'll push that to Agora. Then I'll finish my updates to Gennaro, and then that'll be in there. And then I'm going to add this alternative ZKP based bit map revocation check. Okay. So it is yeah. like it's a step towards Allosaur, like an intermediate yeah. step. So the only thing it would add to the bitmap, at least in my mind, is instead of them having to download the entire bitmap and you reveal the index, you don't have to reveal the index. That's really the only difference. Yeah. And it does not use pairings at all. It would work with any elliptic curve. And it is quite fast. At least as long as you don't go like to a trillion. Like if you go higher than that, then it slows way down, obviously. But I think yeah. it yeah. slow down. <laughs> I think even the regular bitmap approach would slow way down at that point. Exactly. Exactly. And I don't even know what size they're using right now, but like I said, I, I tested it up to 256 billion or two to the 38, and it was still less than a second. So that's re that's pretty reasonable to me. To me, that's more than enough to cover almost all use cases. Like even IoT devices. So anyway, uh cool. I just think it would be good to have two approaches. So but the thing yeah. is if you're gonna use a non-creds too, you're already tied to pairings anyway. So why not use Alasaur? So yeah. that's it. Okay. Okay. Thanks. All right, that's it for our meeting today. Um next week or two weeks from now, we're at the afternoon slot and we've got the Oracle Labs folks. Um I'll make sure I actually I may have um let me see if i've got that is it yeah okay good i'll i'll put this into the notes so that we've got it um of the uh, presentation that i put in and uh interested in any other feedback people have from that oh one other announcement to make um 
any if anyone here is interested in the TDW work, we've got uh, the first meeting coming up um, on Thursday on that. So it's been broadcast in various um, places, but if you're interested, um, join us on Thursday. And that project has moved to DIF, did TDW. You think All we right. should creds to DIF, or should we keep it where it is? Um, it's a good suggestion. I think maybe it would make more sense in DIF and be combined into the, um, the verify or the um, applied cryptography group. Okay. I can talk about that with Kim. You think that would be a good idea, Mike? I don't know. Yeah. Sure. Okay. I, I'll, I think I'll that would be it. interesting and I could um, help set up a conversation about that if that's in it, of interest. Yeah, what well, you you're more involved in diff. Um you're on the the TAC, right? The steering committee. Steering committee, yeah. Your thoughts? Would that be a good place for Oh, I think I think it'd be great. Too. Yeah, Being I really do. I, I think it would be excellent. And um yeah, Mike and whoever else. Um Stephen, if you'd like to um, have a call with Kim, I could probably set that up here fairly quick. Okay. Kim, do you mean? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, what are the pros and the cons of staying versus going? That's probably like what I'd like to, but yeah, I'd be happy to meet yeah. with Kim. I know Kim very well. Yeah, she's awesome. Okay. She's doing a great job. Okay, let's have that conversation. Sounds good. Look for a message here shortly, and I'll see if I can set that up. All right. Thanks. Excellent. Okay, thanks, all. Thanks.